Thank you for joining the webinar, Biologics in Equine Medicine, presented by Al Manor. Today, we are very happy to welcome our expert panel, including Dr. Rick Mitchell of Fairfield Equine and Associates, Dr. Lori Goodrich of Colorado State University, Dr. Steve Latimer of Northwest Equine Veterinary Associates, and Dr. Carol Holland of Natural Vet Palm Beach. My name is Bill King, and I'm the Director of Research and Development and Clinical Research for All Manor, and I'll be your moderator for the next hour. The format of our discussion will consist of direct interaction with the panel on a variety of topics surrounding biologics. We'll also be taking questions from the audience, so if you have questions for our panel, please email them to questions at owlmanormedical.com. We will pause for select questions midway through our discussion, as well as our last 10 minutes together. With that, let's begin our discussion on biologics and equine medicine. And we're gonna to start today with a question directed to Dr. M Mitchell. And it's sort of a broad question. How do you determine in choosing biologics versus steroids, hyaluronic acid, or other options available in your toolkit? Dr. Mitchell? I think there are multiple considerations that you need to, uh, con uh, to have relative to the use of biologics. One is the age of the horse. Uh, that is whether it's quite young or whether it's an older horse, the acute nature or chronic nature of the injury, and also the response to previous treatments. And so I take all of those into consideration. Um, I, I find that uh, many um, uh, joints that have been previously treated with corticosteroids and HA may have responded well, but subsequently have recurred. Uh, and further diagnostics have not necessarily demonstrated um, a, a real severe injury. I have found in many cases that uh, biologics such as ProStride have given me uh, improved resolution and improved duration of um, efficacy uh, with regard to the recurrence of, of inflammation. I like it in young horses because I don't like to start out their career with multiple corticosteroid injections. And I like it in um, older horses that might be metabolically challenged because I don't have the concerns with the use of corticosteroids uh, that might uh, have a negative influence in a horse that had metabolic syndrome or PPID. Uh, so, so those are some of the thoughts that, that I would have. Lori, do you have any, any thoughts or agree agreements or yeah, other situations? I I, I absolutely agree with uh, what Dr. Mitchell has to say. I, I think um, some some of it, just to add to what Dr. Mitchell said, you know, uh, it's it sometimes comes down to also finances, what the owners uh, can afford as well. Uh, and sometimes, you know, even though I would like to do a biologic first because of the reasons that Dr. Mitchell gave, sometimes they want to try the cheaper option um, with steroids, and so. I have no problem with that, especially um, because sometimes you get a, a good response to that. But in the end, uh, a lot of times, then, as Dr. Mitchell said, we, you know, you don't if you don't get the desired response, the ProStride is a is a great next option. And in my experience, if I get a limited response to the the, the corticosteroids, then the uh, ProStride has been longer duration and uh, often a greater, a greater response. How long will you wait to see the effect of a steroid be on those people who want to try the steroid first? How long does the panel generally wait to see an effect of a steroid? A couple weeks or? I, I, would, I would want to wait two to three weeks. I mean, obviously we've shut down certain responses within the joint by virtue of injecting corticosteroids there. So um, I would, I would want to optimize the effect of my uh, um, uh, modified platelet-rich plasma, basically, to, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to have anything there that might suppress. But I tend not to use uh, very protractedly, you know, protracted long-term uh, corticosteroids. I don't use a lot of Depomedrol, for example, except perhaps in the, in the back and, and sacroiliacs, things like that. 
Yeah, I would agree. I, I usually give it in, in my hands, cortical steroid response. If you're going to get one, usually you get that uh, within two to three weeks. And so uh, three-ish weeks, three to four weeks is the time that if I don't get the desired response, then we'll go to the biologics. Great. Um, we uh, were hearing increased use of reports in the literature of biologics use and soft tissue beyond just joints. Carol, could you describe your experience using biologics and tendon sheets? What kind of volumes in your typical protocols have been? Yes, I started to select certain groups of horses and it started with chronic old tendon sheets that I had known to be previously treated with corticosteroids. So it wasn't an option to start where I had to make a diagnosis. I just did ultrasound and I didn't have to, you know, do any nerve blocks or any type of local infiltration of the tendon sheath with carcane. So I started with old tendon sheaths just to see if it would help these horses that were chronically old, especially hind, hind tendon sheaths, uh, digital tendon sheaths. And it was very successful in maintaining the horse for at least three to four months from previous times where they corticosteroid injections actually never did work. In, in a couple of cases. So then I started choosing more cases for it as a primary therapy instead of corticosteroid therapy and fresh tendon sheets. Um, some of them I have done diagnostic blocks prior to using it and I wait about 24 to 48 hours in return with the ProStride. And that was when I had the option to return. I've never injected the tendon sheets with ProStride along with carbocaine at the same time or, or whichever anesthetic I've used. But um, at this point, I have now used multiple times on certain horses for old chronic tendon sheath and also for uh, acute tendon sheaths and had great success for, um, I would say, between four to five days uh, pain relief. It took about four to five days and the horses were doing very well after that. So I have multiple cases of chronic and acute injuries of both, both front and hind legs. What, what kind of volumes of ProStride are you using when doing a tendon sheath? Yes. Generally, um, I use the one to two, I use one to two mils. Preferably, I try to use the entire two cc's or if I get the spin of two to two and a half and the total volume. Um, it generally has not had any problems. I haven't had any swelling reactions. I immediately ice afterwards and haven't had any issues with using the entire volume that I collect. If I have, um, most of the time it's only one tendon sheath, but if I have two hind legs, that's been the most common chronic tendon sheath that I've used it on is um, old, old injuries in horses that are, um, have the, you know, generally old dressage horses that have tendon sheaths behind and just chronic issues. I will try to put as much volume in there as I possibly can. And even if it increases the, pressure at the time, they seem to do very well afterwards within, like I said, four to five days. And I haven't had any flares, maybe just out of sheer, um, you know, luck or whatever, but so far no flares and using ice at the same time. So Stay generally the entire volume. <laughs> I agree with Carol too. I think uh, one, of the, one of the benefits that we have of this system is we have a significant amount of platelet poor plasma that we can judiciously use depending upon, you know, some of these old tendon sheaths are so chronically distended and there's so much fibrosis in them. I think, you know, some people may have some concerns about putting platelets into a tendon sheath. And I think that's probably one of the benefits of the platelet poor plasma is, is you can not only get the, the platelet fraction in, but uh, you can fill these tendon sheaths pretty significantly with some additional platelet poor plasma and the horses seem to do really well. And, and uh, that way I think you're getting good penetration to the entire length of the tendon sheath too. So I think those horses benefit from using a pretty significant amount of platelet poor plasma at, at times. Do you have them rehab? What's the rehab protocol for you? Carol said she was I, using ice. It, it depends upon, it depends upon if it's an acute or a chronic injury. You know, if it's one of these things that uh, maybe you've ultrasounded or had an MRI of it and it's just a chronic 
chronic synovitis or chronic tenosynovitis in those tendon sheets, then I, I really won't rest them. I'll go ahead and just have them keep walking for, for three to five days and then go back to work. But for those acute ones, yeah, I mean, they're the whole icing and, and we're probably doing shockwave on them too, depending upon if there's, if there's a tendon lesion associated with it. Great. I generally have um, most of my patients that particular day, I try to get them done in the morning. If I can't, then the grooms have to wait till later or the owners. But I generally ice them and re rebandage in two to four hours after the injection um, and walk them uh, for at least 15 minutes. Even if it's acute, just a slow general walk, I think that helps move it through. And also the blood product that's added to the tendon sheath sometimes can cause pain. And that's somewhat scary to owners the next day or the two days. And so I feel like the movement pretty quickly afterwards within four to six hours, even if it's, it's not aggressive movement, but some movement helps reduce the pain factor. If there will be any pain factor with injecting the blood product or the, the platelet poor plasma. And that's been successful, even with acute injuries, just enough to graze the horse and move it for a few minutes. So it's been Great. pretty, pretty successful this winter, especially. Great. Bill, can I ask Carol and uh, sure, Steve? Please. And Rick, just because I'm interested, uh, do, do you three also combine with injection uh, non-steroidals? And if you do, what do you use typically and for how long? Just a single dose of banamine that day. That's it. And I think I, that's... Yeah. I use, I use a single dose of 250 milligrams, five cc's, even in a big warm blood. But I like Carol, ice them immediately after. There, I, I usually, you know, if it's a tendon cheese or if it's a coffin joint, uh, fetlock, I bandage them and then I put an ice boot on the horse for 20 to 30 minutes. And then I'll repeat that icing one more time later in the day. Uh, and I know on the human side, there's been some conversation about not icing excessively uh, days after the use of, of PRP. So I usually just do it that first day, but I have found that that has in my, in my experience, uh, I've had one horse out of over 2,000 uh, treatments uh, that had a hot sore leg. Uh, and that's one didn't get iced. <laughs> so, and of one uh, sometimes makes us do things differently, right? Indeed. And that was early on, yes. And Carol and Steve, is that why you also ice then? Have you had an experience where you haven't iced? And you have had that experience. I'm I'm right at a thousand of the these kits now, and I think there have been two that have had a reaction. And I I don't blanket ice ice them after any any joint therapy. You know, maybe if if I would have, maybe I would be zero instead of two. Well, here in Florida mainly um, and a lot of the cases where I see the temperature outside is tremendously hot. Mm -hmm. Even in the winter time, we're, you know, hot. And I know Colorado is hot sometimes in the summer, you get some hot dry days. But so I, I attributed the icing to help just in general. And, um, and again, read on the human side and um, that it sometimes would help after the injection. And I know that the blood products, any type of blood product can cause a little bit of uh, inflammation. But I started with coffin joints and particularly just because of the decreased volume that, that we had to uh, inject and expand in that area. And then just gradually do it on every joint but the stifle. So, um, and as far as giving banamine for the first two years that I used um, Prostrat, I did not give banamine at all. I, we thought that it would probably interfere with the um, amount of anti-inflammatory products, but I think Bill had had given us a study where it did not. So then after that, I started to use banamine just because as a precaution and mainly I think anytime you put a needle in a joint or a tendon, the needle itself can cause some pain. So that was just my generalized recommendation to give them banamine. And I, could, I either do the 250 or 500. And most of the time it, for me, it's 500. So that's my choice. Great, thanks. I, I, I was just interested uh, because I, I, I don't typically ice, but I always usually either use banamine 
or Butte. And, and I usually do that for 48 hours. So um, thanks for sharing that. Uh, Lori, I, I know that you have some experience using different biologics and synovitis and cartilage fibrillation applications. Could you please speak to your experience on there? Sure. So um, I, I also sometimes, because I'm a surgeon, I get to look inside of these joints often, right? And so we are treating many of these horses on a, a tertiary referral um, aspect as well. So uh, when I have a joint where I've operated and, and seen various components of, um, I'll, 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 so I'll speak to the, the cartilage fibrillation and potentially cartilage tearing, et cetera, first. Um, if, if I put an arthroscope into a joint and I see various um, aspects of either fibrillation, most of the time there's synovitis there as well, um, cartilage debridement that I have to do on, this, on the um, surgery side. These cases, I, in my experience, have responded really well to ProStride. Um, and I think that, what, so typically I uh, recommend ProStride, either the horse comes back for suture removal or uh, we'll go, you know, to the referring veterinarian and then at suture removal, many of those horses uh, get injected with ProStride. If that's within the, you know, finan financial constraints, if there are um, of the owner. And I think it's a really great follow-up to those cases. Um, knock on wood, I haven't, I've not had flares uh, at all. And that's, you know, the, the, uh, Recommendations again are usually two days of non-steroidals post injection, but um, these horses I feel um, are great candidates for biologics, um, specifically ProStride, because we really want to continue to create an anabolic environment for that cartilage to heal. Um, on those cases that I come in and they're not surgical candidates, but they do have synovitis, uh, very typically if it's a, a young horse, uh, and, and again, there's not financial constraints. I think it's been a great drug, a great biologic to put into the joint, as Dr. Mitchell uh, mentioned, for first-line treatment. Uh, and that's my preference, really. Um, I think corticosteroids, especially triamcinolone in high-motion joints, um, that's a, a very also effective um, drug to start out with. But my preference on a young joint, because I'd rather just go with creating an anabolic um, environment using the uh, biologic approach. So that's, that's always my preference. Um, again, sometimes it comes down to finances, but that's really my first line of treatment um, in terms of uh, what I reach, what I would like to reach for first. When, if you go into a joint and you, uh, you see that there's some meniscal degeneration, Mm -hmm. Is there a role for biologics there? Has your experience been different compared to cartilage injury? Uh, no, and I, I would say, you know, I, I'm also, so I use different biologics depending on what I see in the joint. And so um, I think when I, often our, our approach with some meniscal degeneration or meniscal tears, I also really um, like on those cases, uh, mesenchymal stem cells, usually we do bone marrow derived. Um, that's our preference. But a lot of times I also take the approach where I like to decrease or quell the inflammation that's in the joint associated with the ongoing synovitis leading up to, you know, scoping a stifle. And then uh, I often will follow up with a biologic first to decrease inflammation in the joint and get um, the joint sort of ready, if you will, for a stem cell injection. So often I'll, you know, um, do what needs to be done in a joint arthroscopically, follow up with a biologic, um, a prostride injection at suture removal, and then often follow up with a mesenchymal stem cell injection after that. Great. Can I ask if you do it at the time? Have you ever done it at the time of surgery or do you wait to the two weeks for the suture removal to do yeah, injections? That's a great question. I typically don't do it at the time of surgery. And the reason, at least 
you know, uh, and, and has also been suggested in the literature is that a lot of times when you put those things in the joint at the time of surgery, you know, you have a lot of sort of uh, vasculitis, if you will, in, in the synovium. And so the, whether or not though it actually stays and is as efficacious as, you know, you wait two weeks, I think, I, I, I think my impression is, is you get more bang for the buck when you wait a couple of weeks than if you do it at the time of surgery. But I think we still need to show that scientifically. Yeah. Has anyone else had any experience in these or following up from surgery? I've had the opportunity to use um, a number of, uh, have a number of cases where we followed up after stifle surgery for meniscal tears, and there's been, say, a, a you know, a, basically a, a we're trimming and cleaning up of the of the synovial environment. Um, and I found that where we might have used to use IRAP um, in multiple doses in a series after um, uh, joint surgery, uh, I've been able to use uh, the ProStride very effectively maybe three weeks to a month after surgery, and then again, another month later, and been very happy with how those horses have recovered and gone on to do well. On uh, relative to just synovitis of the stifle, um, I ultrasound the vast majority of the stifles that I look at at one point or another. And if I get an indication of a pretty significant synovitis, and again, as Lori mentioned earlier, if the, if the client will economically accept the responsibility there, um, I'll oftentimes use a ProStride there uh, in a series of at least two a month apart. And I've been very happy with how the horses have responded and seem to stay sounder longer. So I, I, I have had positive results there. Great. Um, uh, Steve, I know that you've had some experience using different biologics and suspensory applications. What's been your experience there? I'm, I'm especially more of a fan now of using the, uh, the PRP, uh, by all manner, is it the restogen? Is that what it's called? Restogen, yeah. Yeah. Uh, for the, for the suspensory branch core lesions, I think it's, it's worked really well for me. And, and in addition, you know, just some of those uh, suspensories that are uh, the proximal suspensories that are pretty acute and they're just super swollen and, and they have maybe a lot of uh, the muscular portion that's really swollen, but they don't have any uh, significant big core lesions, just maybe a lot of bony reaction. So I, I like, again, using the, the ProStride just kind of diffusely with, with a fair amount of the platelet pore plasma to just uh, diffusely inject just to get a lot of the, uh, just to block the cytokines locally pretty much and, and just to help create a, a more beneficial healing environment. I used to do, uh, I used to do that with, with IRAP, but I think this is probably a better idea to get combination of not only the, the platelets, but interleukin antagonists. So, so that's, that's been kind of my go-to now, but, but I really, I've been really happy with with the core lesions in the in the suspensory branches, especially you know the ones that that funnel right down to the insertion on the sesamoids. In general, like how much of the platelet pore are you are you adding, or are you, what is it really vary or? Yeah, it varies, but on on the for the proximals, I'll maybe put uh, six to seven cc's of the platelet pore, so I got to about 10 cc is the total volume and, and I'll use the ultrasound to, to maybe put a couple mils uh, uh, every, every couple centimeters on, you know, as much as I can on the, the medial and lateral aspect of the proximal suspensory. Just to kind of does anyone, else, does anyone else have a similar experience or a little bit different treatment protocol? Carol or Stuart? Oh. Oh, yeah, I have did, I've been using it a lot in branches and I use typically if I have some inflammation hind suspensories without a lot of change on the ultrasound, um, I'll do one mil. Uh, I've been doing only one cc, which sounds very interesting. 
something to add now. I'm glad that you have tried it and, and I'm planning to try it, I think. But one cc of the actual ProStride, not the uh, PRP portion, but I used the ProStride in one cc um, high origin of the hind suspensory and, um, and horses that are not completely injured, you know, just the inflammation that you see or maybe palpation or just a little bit of lameness that I've diagnosed that instead of a hock inflammation. But um, the branches I've used a lot, uh, uh, many times um, in branch injuries with the direct injection, ultrasound guided injection. And I'll also put the platelet pore plasma there, but but not, um, I haven't done it around the uh, origin of the suspensory. So that sounds very interesting to try. One of the other things that, that I'll do with those branch injuries too, is I'll, I'll oftentimes put some of that in the fetlock joint too, just because, you know, we may, may get some benefit there. I definitely, I definitely do that very commonly, Steve. Uh, we'll use uh, the ProStride, especially if it's an axial lesion on the branch. Uh, and uh, then what I'll also do uh, is uh, immediately shockwave uh, the area uh, with some of the work that I know has been done in vitro that indicates greater activation of the platelets. Uh, I think the shockwave therapy has helped immediately after you inject. And uh, I, like you, have used the uh, ProStride product uh, in proximal suspensories in and around them for those that were really swollen and really inflamed, uh, whether they were chronic or acute. Uh, and I especially like it in the ones that are acutely inflamed. Bill, can I ask? Uh, Steve, a question. Sure. Uh, Steve, I, I, I'm just curious. I'm curious to know: is, is there a reason why you reach for the uh, PRP, the Restigen, over um, the ProStride product? Re you know, it sounds like you specifically use the PRP product for for that versus ProStride. But Carol sounds like she's done the ProStride, um, and so any reasons there? So I, I use the ProStride for the proximal suspensories, but I haven't put ProStride in a branch core lesion. I've just put PRP in the branch core lesions. And I, I guess that's just kind of maybe my preference. I don't, Rick, do you put ProStride in, in the core lesions of the branches? I've, I've, I've done it both ways. Um, if I didn't need a really large volume, I use the ProStride actually. Uh, because, but you do get a bigger volume from the restogen. And so it just depends on what, what you're trying to achieve. But I don't really see a downside in using the uh, ProStride product uh, okay. in, in the, uh, and, and certainly I've gotten good results. I mean, I still use with, uh, stem cells and some of those and so forth as well. So, uh, but, but I, you know, I have definitely had it uh, be very beneficial. With the platelet product, uh, Dr. Goodrich, it does give you quite a bit of extra platelets to put in the fetlock joint too. Mm -hmm. well, while we heard the shockwave timing mentioned and uh, in vitro data, I know Lori, some of that work has come from from your group. Could you speak on the on what you think the role of shockwave and biologics are together from from your findings? Yeah, well, Dr. Seabaugh from our um, sports medicine and rehab group has, has done some of that work looking at the um, shockwave uh, effects on uh, the platelets and has found in vitro that, you know, they do uh, sort of, there's a beneficial effect uh, as was stated on the platelets in terms of when you shock them, uh, perhaps, you know, they explode, if you will, <laughs> or rupture. Um, and cause a burst of the growth factors. And, and I think that's an interesting approach. And, you know, it used to be that we were all sort of hesitant to put, to shockwave any biologic, whether it's a stem cell or a platelet rich product or, you know, any biologic um, because we didn't want to harm that biologic component. But it's interesting. And again, Katie, some of Katie's work has shown this, um, that you actually get rupture and perhaps a burst of the growth factors, which is what you would would like. Um, we've also looked at work uh, in, and this paper was just published, uh, looking at mesenchymal stem cells as well. And and you don't um, you don't harm mesenchymal stem cells either with shockwave, 
um, and you may get a little stimulation of some of the uh, cytokines that come out, the good cytokines that come out of, of stem cells as well. So I don't really see a downside. And now, it, you know, uh, Katie's work and others' work has, has has changed a little what I do in terms of now I put the biologic in and then shockwave it, um, where we didn't used to do that before. So um, I think the bottom line is there there may be a, a, a beneficial effect in putting the biologic in first, whether that's PRP or APS or stem cells, and then shock waving because you you get, it seems, a per, perhaps an additive effect. Are others doing that as well? How long? Absolutely. Yeah, I think, you know, ho hopefully what we're doing there is one plus one equals three. You know, if we can, if we can maybe get, uh, some like like Dr. Goodrich said, get some additive effect there by by improving the uh, the the environment locally. I I always do shockwave right after I put platelets or or prostrate into a soft tissue structure. Carol, yeah, I was curious. I was just curious how long you guys are waiting. Like, what do you think is the length of time? The mo the farthest length of time or the longest length of time that you could wait to shockwave, would you want to do it within 30 minutes or can do you think you can wait 24 hours? Is there any research or any preferences by anybody on that one? I do it. I inject it and then shockwave it like within the same uh, sedation, you know, so I do it right away. I don't, I don't wait. And, you know, when we've done it, looked at it in vitro where we put you know, biologic X and or Y into a culture dish, and then we put a shockwave on it. Uh, you know, again, it's 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 within that within minutes. So I don't wait at all. No, I am. I, um, I have been more inclined to shockwave uh, uh, the joints. Uh, that's you know, uh, referring back to what Steve commented about injecting. Uh, the fetlock joint when there's distal suspensory branch injury. Uh, and I've always done that immediately after. And subsequently, uh, we started uh, shock weaving the soft tissues as well, via the suspensory origin or branch or whatever, immediately after we inject. Great. Or, I, mean, I think, Bill, I was going to just add to uh, uh, the, the comments on injecting the ligament as well as the joint. I al we also do that in coffin joint in the collateral ligaments as well, because I do think when you have, you know, uh, origin or insertion collateral ligament issues, you often, and we just talked about this in rounds yesterday or the day before, um, but you know, you often have probably a compromised coffin joint capsule as well. So I do think putting a biologic, you know, uh, such as Prostride, or PRP into the ligament as well as putting that into the joint, I think you get a hopefully you know a beneficial effect um, of both of those structures, which are often commonly you know affected in those in that disease as well. Agree. Great. Actually, that's that's great. We're about uh, halfway through our, our time together here, and some of this discussion leads into some of the questions we've received. So we'll take a little little break in my questions for some other questions here. And one of the questions we got is what volumes of prostride do you use in coffins or for fetlocks? How much are you putting in? Um, I use one kit per joint uh, in terms of coffin joints. And I use the basic three mils that essentially would uh, be derived from the uh, uh, one kit. Sometimes I'll expand it a little bit with the platelet poor plasma and a, maybe a really large horse, but I do it simply by leaving a little extra uh, platelet poor plasma in the, uh, in the tube after the initial spin and then drawing it and drawing it off rather than adding back. So I'll sometimes get a four or five mil uh, dose that way. I try to limit the volume I put in a coffin joint to about four mils and a pastor joint. I, I, I just put the, the prostride fraction in. So it's, you know, two and a half to three mils. I, I did make the mistake two times that I can think of, of 
adding a little bit too much of the platelet poor plasma, but you know, maybe two to three mils. Uh, and subsequently, the, those two horses I can think of were, as soon as they woke up from sedation, they were uh, nearly non weight bearing. And, uh, you know, uh, within an hour or two, they were totally fine. But, but I, I learned a lesson from not over distending those pastern and coffin joints with, uh, with the platelet poor plasma in addition to the prostride. Yeah, I think it. My, in some of my cases, it's economically uh, driven. Also, if um, we're doing coffin joints on a horse that has not previously had uh, injections and it's the first time, I might use one kit for two coffin joints, and then would distend it with platelet poor plasma or not, depending on the volume of the prostride that I receive, which occasionally sometimes is different for me. And I can pull up two kits and get different volume, maybe two in one and three in another. So um, I prefer to use one kit per joint. I think that's very, very beneficial, but sometimes uh, certain clients are, you know, pension pennies or concerned about the money. And I definitely want to get the prostride. So I will distend it with the platelet core plasma and use uh, I will use a minimum of one and a half cc's no matter what and then sometimes three I haven't gone to four or five for that very reason that I've had some horses that are just they'll hold their leg up and it's pretty scary to the owner even after banamine too so I tend to keep a lower volume in the coffins more than not and the, yeah, the I, question I, oh sorry Larry oh that's okay I, yeah I, I would love to usually use a, a kit per joint but Again, if it's a financially um, constrained client, then I, I have no problem splitting between two coffin joints or two fetlocks. I guess where I have a tougher time uh, with that is stifles. You know, I, I usually always prefer to use one kit per stifle just because of the volume issues. I would say too, if I'm, in, I'm injecting distal hock joints, I'll use one kit per leg. So I'll split it, I'll expand it just a little bit and I'll use one kit per leg. So I'll do the DIT and the TMT separately and uh, split the dose between those. And I've had nice results with that. And the question also was about okay. the fetlock and I always put a total of either four or five cc's in the fetlock joint depending upon the size of the horse. So, so I'll usually add one or two, two mils of the platelet poor plasma. Another question we got here was, uh, do you use any antibiotic with your biologic? I know that, um, that Laura, you've had some research on different antibiotics recently, but what, I have the intersection of research and clinical experience here. What, what are, what's the never. panel doing? I, I never, not one time ever, either with Prostride or IRAP, I, I've never administered an antibiotic. I give it systemically. Neither. I, I give a prophylactic dose of genomycin whole IV, but nothing in the nothing in the joint. And uh, I I agree. I, I never not one time ha and uh, have given a amikacin or genocin with a, a biologic. And I would say with our recent research, um, Dr. Lynn Pez and I uh, presented some of this at AAEP. We're we're learning a lot about. <laughs> Uh, appropriate antibiotics and joints and, you know, whether or not you ever need it ever. Um, there's plenty, there's two or three p good clinical studies out there that really suggest that, um, you know, we're not getting any, this is probably a discussion for another day, but um, not getting great, ne that's not needed in the joint in that amicase and at the current um, levels we're using it, you know, anywhere between 125 to 250 milligrams is actually can be quite toxic uh, to the tissues within the joint. And that's some ongoing research right now. Again, Lynn Pez and I presented some of this at AAEP, but it was quite shocking in terms of how uh, unhappy those tissues are post amicacin injection. So I've actually gone to maybe using amicacin 50% of the time with corticosteroids injections to not using it ever now. And I never use it with biologics. I will say one thing, uh, like Dr. Mitchell, if I'm injecting any, any joint that 
takes a needle longer than an inch and a half, then I do give a systemic dose of genomycin. We had yeah, some discussion. I had a, a recent. Go ahead, please. No, I just was going to say I had a recent case, very interesting, of a pastern joint infection from um, an, uh, cellulitis in the leg. It, it went into the joint. And that particular joint we treated with antibiotics as a flush or the surgical center did. And then within two days we did um, Prostride in and su subsequently used Prostride at, at each time of the joint flush after that. There were three joint flushes and then they introduced Prostride back into the joint at the same time um, with an infection in, a, you know, a cultured infection in the joint. And that horse has done very well. Um, it was sort of an experiment because it was not going to go to surgery and we didn't know what would happen, but it was done at the same time because of the infection in the joint. So it turned out very well. Thank you. <laughs> it would seem to me logically that it would set up a, an environment of protection rather than one of susceptibility as opposed to what corticosteroids do. Great. Well, we received a lot of good questions here and we'll see what time allows for at the end. We'll move on to the, back to the, planned discussion. How's that sound? So, um, uh, uh, Carol, I know you've had some, uh, some, some use of uh, different biologics with navicular syndrome. Could you speak to what you've done there in your clinical experience? Well, particularly just, um, I use it primarily in the bursa. I feel like it's the number one thing for me. In fact, I've totally gone away from using any corticosteroids in the bursas at all. Just based on um, a personal preference, I don't even offer the corticosteroid in the bursa any longer. And, and I feel obviously as with any type of navicular syndrome, you have to you know, use every option to help the horse with chewing and um, any type of uh, other shockwave therapy at the same time. But I typically put in one to three mLs and use only Prostride. Um, any calls that I've gotten from other practitioners or myself, that's had reactions to navicular bursa injections has been an over uh, amount, a large, too large amount in the bursa. But um, I used a radiograph uh, image, digital radiograph image guided injection for that and um, been had great luck with just using that alone in prostride and typically try to get in the entire amount. So three cc's, two and a half, and I use one kit per bursa. Do others have a similar or different experience? I I like to use it in the bursa here and there as well. And I think, you know, those cases, we we get some of those cases, cases that have, get bursoscopy, you know, they have had an MRI and we have established that there's tearing of the deep digital flexor tendon. And, and again, a lot of those we get to see as well. So I think um, those are great cases to uh, not, I mean, we never use corticosteroids on those. I agree with Carol that, you know, we really would like to get the biologic environment to um, become anabolic and help heal. So it makes a lot of scientific sense to use a biologic in those cases. Um, so switching topics a little bit back to something uh, potentially more surger surgically. Um, Lori, what's your experience been using different biologics for subchondral bone cysts? And uh, sort of, I guess, a related question I would have is when would you use a cultured stem cell versus a bone marrow concentrate for that application or others? Yeah, um, I will say that, you know, in the paper that we did uh, out of CSU some years ago now, I think it was published in 2008, that um, the corticosteroid inject, so when we see these in young horses for the subchondral bone cysts, let's, let's say the most common population here is in, in you know, medial femoral condylar cysts. In a young horse, we'll still inject corticosteroids into those. We have very good evidence that we have a good response rate to, the, to, uh, to that syndrome. And I think um, controlling inflammation and decreasing the inflammation that the cystic lining um, is producing, you know, those cytokines that is making the subchondral cysts grow, uh, really needs to have the inflammation controlled to stop the clinical signs associated with that. So in those cases, we still inject triamcinolone in younger 
um, horses, so two years old and less, I think it still would make sense to use um, ProStride potentially in those. However, we have good documentation that corticosteroids uh, like triamcinolone um, works very well. So in those cases, actually in a young horse, I would still uh, tend to use that because that's what our, you know, um, our, our experience shows fairly good success rate. As they get older, however, those cases are much more challenging. And in those cases, a lot of times surgery uh, plus or minus a, a screw and um, a biologic such as, you know, a platelet rich fibrin graft is what those horses end up getting quite a bit. And I know if you ask 10 different veterinarians, they're going to have 10 different approaches, but that's actually our, uh, that's typically what I do currently. I think it makes sense to use a pro stride and I'd love to hear other people's experience on those, but again, it's hard to go away from something that, you know, again, we've studied and shown a, a very good clinical effect in young horses for subchondral bone cysts. On, on um, horses that are not surgical candidates, um, certainly uh, getting a biologic such as ProStride in there makes a lot of sense. Anybody else? To hear what everyone else thinks though. I've, I've certainly used- I had one actually. Uh, I've certainly used uh, ProStride with uh, subchondral cysts, um, and especially those that I thought, you know, in the older horse were of initial traumatic origin, where there was probably a subchondral contusion and subsequent uh, bone loss. Um, and uh, they maybe were not really surgical candidates, uh, and, or the client was not inclined. And, the use of ProStride uh, and shockwave therapy has helped these horses continue to function. I won't tell you that the cyst went away, but uh, functionally the horses were uh, useful. Okay. And uh, the, uh, Rick, what's your experience been with uh, using biologics and SIs and facets? Do you have experience there or what do you do? I've had a, a fair amount of experience using them in, in uh, synovial facets, uh, in, uh, specifically the neck. Um, and uh, I have to say that I've been very encouraged. Uh, a lot of those horses were horses that I may have initially used uh, corticosteroids and that had responded well, but then subsequently were sore again or performing badly. And I went to uh, the uh, PRP type product, and it was ProStride. Uh, and especially with the horses that are competing in the FEI divisions where there's concern about drug withdrawal and, and proximity of injection to competition and so forth. And I, I would encourage its use. Uh, my experience with it in sacroiliacs is minimal. So I, I would yield to someone else to comment about that. Um, uh, because of the fact that the sacroiliac joint itself is so small, it's really more of a regional injection you're doing. Uh, and uh, I, I'm just, I've not pursued a great deal of that, uh, but I, I would like to hear from the other uh, participants. Rick, I have a, a handful of horses that most recently I've, I've used two kits for sacroiliac joints and I've utilized oh, probably 15, 15 to 18 milliliters of the platelet pore plasma along with the, uh, the prostrate fraction, just because like you say, it's a, it's a regional injection. And I feel like similar to when we use uh, corticosteroids plus saline uh, to inject the S SI region. Uh, and, I, and I feel like at least with the handful I've done that, that the results my, my feedback from the clients was as good as using corticosteroids. So, uh, and I know Dr. Dr. Benoit uh, at AAP this year said that he's gone to using all PRP for his sacroiliac injections. When you, uh, Rick, when you're doing the facet injections, what kind of volume are you using? Um, I will, what I will do specifically with the ProStride is I will, Meant to do as I mentioned earlier, on that first spin that you do, um, I will pull off all of the PRP 
and then put back into the first uh, container about five mils of the P, uh, platelet poor plasma. Then we'll go ahead and draw off our aliquot, which will be close to 10 to 12 cc's that we put in the second spin container. Uh, that will usually yield me around six or seven mils. And then I will put two mils per facet. So I can use two kits and do like C4, 5, 5, 6, and 6, 7, uh, which it works out fairly economically for the client and, and, and it's effective. What kind of durability are you seeing from, from that, those injections? It depends entirely upon the extent of the pathology. I mean, I've had some horses I've done one time and never had to do them again. And I've had others I've had to do in four to six months. So it, it just it just depends on the, on the case, I think, the nature of pathology. Okay. Uh, Carol, I know that you've had a, a recent interesting application with, um, with, uh, with wounds slash sort of uh, gastrointestinal use. For, for the PRP and the ProStrike, could you please speak to that case just as a thing to get people to think about um, the use of these things for potentially different applications? Yes, we um, are, I have used a lot of the platelet poor plasma in wounds. And recently um, we had a case of a horse that um, was scoped for um, gastric ulcers and they found an in unusually large pyloric ulcer that appeared to even be almost similar to a tumor. It was biopsied. The horse was in severe pain and um, the medicine doctor, um, Dr. Meg Miller, felt like this horse was not going to um, recover at any point because the previous cases she'd had similar. So she said, what else can we try? It was my case. I'd refer to her. And um, I said, well, let's, I've used a lot of prostride or probably poor plasma in wounds. So can we inject it? And so we, just as a process, we had to try to find a way to inject. And she was concerned about the injection of the pyloric ulcer type granuloma around the pyloric valve with uh, that it would bleed too much. So we just modified that and put, um, we actually first tried mixing it with honey and the owner was willing to do anything because the horse was not going to survive without any therapy. So we mixed a little bit of honey with the, with prostride and, um, and we put a volume of the entire prostride, which ended up being about three cc's with uh, 10 cc's of, um, of probably the poor plasma and then made it sticky and injected it through the scope on the actual um, granulomatous type lesion that this horse had on the ulcer. And then the horse also did go into the hyperbaric chamber at, um, three times a week. We did those injections four times and in six months, now the horse is almost completely healed and she's never had a case that was this, you know, uh, uh, progressed in lesion type issues that has recovered. Um, and they just end up having that chronic lesion forever, but this horse has done very well, but we did four injections and we did it that, that way with the um, scope and we injected it actually through the scope or she did when, when we were there. So we collected the prostrate and did that. It was a very interesting case. It did bleed a little bit, not as much as you would think. And that was her concern of perforating the ulcer or per perforating the granuloma because the tissue's compromised anyway, but we never had any reaction to that. And, and um, it worked out very well. So Fun. I like it for all wounds, skin wounds anyway. Hmm? Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> That's a fun case. <laughs> I just, I wanna know how much pressure it took to get the, uh, the honey injected down that little <laughs> diameter. We, we diluted it with hot, hot water. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it was not, you know, we were trying to find a sticky type um, substance because it, we thought maybe if you put the pro start in the liquid is just, you know, fall off wherever we want it. And it actually kind of foamed a little bit, made a foamy type sticky substance and it didn't clog up the scope and it. And she, she was first concerned about that. But um, since honey has healing properties anyway, we thought that was the safest because the fibrin that we could, the thrombin, excuse me, thrombin we could have purchased, um, we thought that would stick too much to the inside of the catheter. And so we used honey instead diluted with hot water. 
and we mixed the hot water and cringed when we put the ProStride, <laughs> you know, diluted the ProStride, but it worked out very well. And, and luckily this owner has, um, was willing to try anything. And so four ProStride kits and the ulcer was nothing compared to not having our horse back. So it worked out very well. So. Just thought it was an interesting case and uh, a really uh, innovative thinking. So we have uh, five minutes left. And, and with that time, I'd like to ask the panel how you go about communicating the value proposition of biologics to, you, to your owners. I know that a, a lot of the uh, conversations here were started with depending on the economic situation of the owner. And so uh, I'd like to start with, um, with Steve, how you go about communicating the value proposition to the owners? Certainly the, the region that I live in, uh, we're, we're, not, we're not graced with a, a massive population of, uh, of high-end horses. And, uh, and, you know, we do have a lot of pretty wealthy people, but there's, there's, there's not the, the caliber of horses in the numbers as other regions of the United States. But, but realistically, you know, I think my attitude when I am looking at a horse that has got either acute or chronic pathology in a joint is that I know that corticosteroids are just a Band-Aid. And there's, there's documented evidence now published by JAMA uh, that even triamcinolone can result in in cartilage degeneration in humans. And, and so my attitude when I'm discussing this with clients is, you know, we're, we're trying to manage your horse, not just for the next eight to 12 weeks, but we're trying to manage your horse for the rest of its life. And, and so if, if I could grab a biologic instead of a corticosteroid any day, any horse, I will do that. And I convey that just simply to the client that in, in the long run, you're going to save a little bit of money by repetitive use of corticosteroids, but is it going to be at, at the risk of jeopardizing your horse's ability to compete five years from now? And, and so I think obviously, you know, I've, I've been using IRAP since the, since basically the day it was approved for use. And, and now I've been using a pretty significant volume of ProStride and we use a fair bit of, of stem cells. And, and, uh, and I just have to say, I think, you know, at the end of the day, the clients really appreciate if you just sit down and give them your honest opinion about corticosteroids are, are really not the best choice for your horse. And, and realistically, they're probably not even financially the best choice because of the, maybe the, the long-term contraindications. Great. Uh, others? Wants I, to just, go first. I, I personally yeah. think that go ahead, Joe. Yeah, no. go ahead. I think we all have to <laughs> no, it's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> I just think I totally agree with if you have the discussion with your client. I mean, anymore the horses are there, they're almost like a pet. And I kind of mentioned to them that all the supplements that they'll buy off the shelf and the money that they spend that this money that they would spend, even if it's a large amount to begin with, it'll save the horse in the long run. And, um, and it's more innovative thinking. It's the latest and greatest. If you can use that word, uh, we're even more innovative and, and try to save our horses more than they do in human medicine a lot, because still, I think most orthopedic doctors are starting with steroids. So um, I give that option to them too. And, and just show that since ProStride has been available and we've been able to use it you know, I've used it now for six and a half, almost seven years, that the benefits over time and repeated doses has even um, improved the joint quality. And people like that, you know, that option. I, I pursue it very much like I do diagnostics for lameness. Um, if a client comes to me, even, even some of the clients that you would not call high end, uh, with a, with a recurrent lameness, um, I usually spend some time talking to them about, you know, the more specific we get with the diagnostics and the more accurate we get, uh, in order to fix something, you need a proper diagnosis. And so 
And that oftentimes then leads us into the conversation about what's the best thing for this particular injury or this particular tissue. Uh, and um, as Carol's mentioned just a minute ago, you know, a little innovative thinking too about, about you know, what is the trend and what do we know now about biologics that we didn't know 10 years ago. And what do we know, as Steve said, about some of the predisposition of corticosteroids to maybe, you know, head the joint in the wrong direction over time. So uh, I, I try to give them that talk. And I, I've been surprised to see that uh, even uh, people with uh, not elite type horses were very interested in doing this because they cared about their horse and they wanted to do the thing that was made the most sense in the direction of getting the horse better. One other thing to, uh, to add on top of what Rick is saying is I think for people out there that have not, have not jumped into using this particular product, you will find that there are horses that are absolutely not sound with corticosteroids that will be absolutely sound with using this product. And then I will just finish off too that I, I I agree with what everyone said, and I think maybe it you know in Colorado we see everything from the horse that's the ranch horse that there's not, you know uh, they they really don't want to have a big upfront expense to you know the very high level um, athlete rainer cutter um, event horse etc. And I've been like Rick mentioned I've been really pleased. Um, with once you sit down and explain your methodology of thinking, and now I think it's great because we can back up a lot. Of course, I'm an academic. So, you know, for me, it's important to back it up with the science and we can do that now. There's studies that are out there, not a ton, and we still need more clinical studies, but we can back it up with science. And as Rick mentioned, you know, I approach it as I approach diagnostics and MRIs. Do you want to do an MRI now? and figure out what's wrong and treat it appropriately? Or do you want to treat with steroids, stall rest, be six or eight months down the line, and then still you're coming back to your biologics, you know? Exactly. You're gonna, if you actually do the math there, you're gonna be out a lot more money when you're eight months down the road. And now we're coming back to the biologics and doing an MRI. So, so I think upfront discussion, um, I've been very surprised and pleased as well. Great. Well, th thank you all for your response to that question. I think it's uh, really important to be able to communicate the, the value. So thank you to our panel for their thoughtful responses and shared expertise today. Thank you to everyone who joined online as well. And special thanks to those that submitted their questions. If we were unable to field your questions during this broadcast, we'll follow up by email. We truly hope this broadcast has been insightful and everyone has learned about new technologies and ways to implement biologics in your practice. If you'd like to learn more about all manner products, including ProStride APS, Restigen PRP, or Centrate BMA, please visit our website, omveterinary.com, or contact us at info at allmannermedical.com. Thank you again to everyone for your participation. We hope everyone continues to stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you.